do what some of the old timers call it, fanning it. See, by doing that right there, puts a little air through it and cools it down a little bit. Yeah, we got, got this oven here on this uh, cooker and we like to put stuff in there and keep it warm and cook it. And these almonds are, we put them in there and give them a good roasting and let them get good and hot and they're just good to snack on. We just uh, enjoy, we put stuff in there from time to time and just, just, just enjoy eating on it. And uh, those almonds are real good. I've got plenty of them, so it's, we like to enjoy them. <laughs> beautiful day, beautiful day. So we've already got ourselves a five gallon bucket of juice made here. And this is my strainer here. Uh, back in the old days, they would have used burlap or cheesecloth or maybe some window curtains or something like that. But it's pretty important to strain the juice because if you don't strain the juice, uh, there's a lot of, I'll show you in the end here, uh, bits and pieces of fine cane stuff in it. But wow, look at how green that is. It's hard to believe you can make anything edible out of that, right? But uh, as, as we're going to boil this, all that green is going to be boiled out of it and float to the top. And I have down there a skimmer, and I'll be showing you all a little later how that we skim all that green off of it. But anyway, right there you can see bits and pieces of cane. If you didn't strain that, it'd be pretty chewy. Yep, so I'm going to rinse this out and give this cleanup water to Maddie, being she's on break right now. These mules love this, love this water. It's because that little bit of sweet in it, they really like that. So yeah, my strainer here is a little bit modern compared to what they did. I'm supposed to be doing things, you know, the old fashioned way, trying to preserve a little bit of history here. But it does clean real easy. I'm going to pour that in her water bucket here. And slide it under the gate. There you go, Maddie. Yeah, she knows what that is. She'll put her head down there in a minute and drink. All right, now that we've got the juice in there, I'm going to pull out some more modern tools and start this fire. I know back in the day they didn't have diesel fuel or a fire stick, but it works pretty nice. Spray a little diesel fuel on there. There we go. Well, so it was pretty difficult, yeah. 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 Mom and Mom and Daddy was carrying the load and the and the. Kids was just having a good time. That's it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have a little bit of a problem with leaves and stuff falling out of the trees today. But it's that time of the year. So anyway, now that that's warming up, I'm going to go over here to the mill and get Ida going here and uh, grind some more cane. So this is one of my mules here. Her name is Ida. Hey girl, are you ready to go? Huh? Come, let's go. By the way, I wanna introduce him. Come on around here, John. This is my good friend, John. He actually lives in Texas, but he's uh, been in the Pigeon Forge, Gatlinburg for a few years, uh, like a camper and and he uh, found me and, and uh, got sort of started liking making sorghum and he comes out here and helps me a lot and, and also comes to Muddy Pond and helps with the big operation and just uh, got to be a great friend and he's gonna be around here helping me some today. Kerry Kane, he does the pressing. Cooking, the only thing he doesn't really like to do, he doesn't like to f cook the batch off, but there's not much else that he can't do. He's been around me enough here, so yeah. All right, Ida, you ready to go? Let's go. Come on. Come on. Get you a bite. It's called eating on the run, fast food. So as Ida goes around in circles here, I feed these sorghum cane stalks in this old three roller cane press. It actually has a date on the bottom of it here. It was 
Uh, it has 1896 on there. Now I'm, I'm going to say I have no proof that it was built in 1896, but I do know that this Chattanooga Plow Company, it says it right here on the side, Chattanooga Plow Company was in business till 1952. And they put the same date on all those mills. So that 1896, which is on the bottom of this mill, probably was when it was invented. Um, so, so really don't know exactly how old the mill is. I actually found this mill and uh, the bearings on the bearings were in real bad shape and there's a couple pieces missing and I rebuilt it and uh, got it in good working condition. You can see there it's, it's really a grinding the juice out of the cane. You can see how the cane is falling all to pieces and pressing the juice out. And my good mule Ida there, three years old, just keeps going in circles until I tell her to stop. John bringing me another armload of cane here. Thank you, thank you very much. But this would have been the way it was done back in the day uh, when people lived here in, uh, in the Great Smoky Mountains, especially in Cage Cove, but also in the, in the region um, all the way from eastern North Carolina to Arkansas, Missouri, all the way north to the Great Lakes. A lot of sorghum was made back in the day uh, because, uh, because we can grow this cane in uh, three and a half to four months where a sugar cane takes um, pretty much a whole year to grow. And one of the differences is sorghum cane has a seed head and uh, you plant it with seeds. Hey, I was just talking about you, how good you were doing, and then you stop on me. There she goes. <laughs> but anyway, it was a very popular sweetener back in the day in, in this region. And uh, that back there would have been an original mill, and then over there was the original furnace that was used here in the Smoky Mountains. But yeah, I'm going to give... Uh, give Ida a little treat here and she comes around so this this is one of the little seed heads that I left on the stalk and just I, I leave them on purposely just to give her a little treat and they like those so I come out here and I tell everybody I'm putting a little fuel in my tractor <laughs> come on Ida So it takes, uh, if you can keep Ida going pretty steady, and fill a five gallon bucket of juice in about 20 minutes, something like that. So amazing how much juice is in this cane. But anyway, you know, some of the viewers might say, you know, from having watched past films from where we our big operation at home, like, well, why are you out here doing it this old-fashioned way? Why don't you just, don't you have enough to do at home on the farm? And, you know, it looks like we have a very busy schedule at home on the farm. And for sure we do. For sure we do. But, you know, at home on the farm there at Muddy Pond, uh, if you look around here, lots of folks around here from... Eastern North Carolina, all in Tennessee and Kentucky, Louisiana, that are just standing here right now, that if we didn't come here and do this, uh, these people never would get to see us at Muddy Pond. And that's one of the things that drives us to, to, to leave the farm and come do this, uh, because we, it exposes us to so many people that we never would get to see at Muddy Pond on our farm. And then on top of that, um, doing it this way, doing this sorghum making demonstration, um, the older folks remember this as a child, uh, you know, because this was the way daddy and grandpa was doing this when they were children. And then the younger ones, they have never seen anything like this. And so because of that, um, for Sherry and I, it's very rewarding 
to, to be able to leave the farm and to, um, and to show how that this used to be done. And then the younger ones that have never seen it, like, wow, what is this? And, and so it, it's really, a, really re rewarding for us. And then the other thing is, um, so, so it's the three of us brothers, Pete, Eddie, and myself, that are in partners there at Muddy Pond. And, uh, of course, Pete and Eddie don't travel and, and market or sell their sorghum. And for us to get out and do this, that's, this opens the door to a whole totally different customers that never make it, again, never make it to Muddy Pond. And so together, with us getting out and doing these demonstrations and running the operation at home at Muddy Pond, it helps us, makes, makes it a, a possible for all of us to survive and to be able to make a living at it. Yeah. And so by, by coming out and doing these demonstrations, uh, all we are doing is doing a demonstration. And if, uh, if at some point you see the cane up on top of the trailer that we brought along. Come on, Ida. Come on. So we, we, bring, we bring enough cane just to do a demonstration. Here in Tennessee, the health department is pretty strict on it. You're not allowed to sell anything that you make outdoors like this. You have to be indoors like we are at Muddy Pond and uh, the health department has to inspect us and get our certificate, you know, and be compliant to the state that we are doing, making food in a safe, cleanly way. And so um, what we make out here, when we come, you know, the park has us to come here and, and to do this. And uh, that, that's the understanding that we have with them is that we don't sell it because because of that, and then also the park does not want the liability of us making it out here and taking the chance that something could get in the juice or something could get in the cooking. And, and so we just, we just do a demonstration. We don't sell at all what we make out here. Uh, I promise you it is good stuff. When we get done making it, I'll show you a little later on. I'll put it, I'll put it in a barrel and take it back home and uh, I'm not going to tell you what I do with it, but it's, it's good for human consumption. <laughs> good stuff. My friend John here takes a lot of it home with him, and, uh, and he, he's using it. Yeah, since we got to be friends, he has just gotten totally converted to sorghum. He loves it. He, he, he loves it on everything. He's just excited about it. Yeah. <laughs> so you just can't sell it. Just can't sell it, right, yes. Yeah, we're just, just doing a demonstration of it. So. But it's good to eat. It is good to eat, yes, I promise you. Heating it, heating it to, the, uh, cooking it to 230 degrees hot, yeah, it, it's good to eat. There's nothing wrong with it, yeah. Must have good teeth to chew that up, huh? <laughs> you said she's only three? Yeah, she's only three. Well, I was back May the 17th is her birthday. Oh. Yeah, and then the other one, Maddie, there is... Uh, is 17 years old. Yeah. Hard to believe there's that much difference in her. Uh, Maddie and Ethel. Ethel was a year older than Maddie. They were full sisters, but back in 2020, we unfortunately she developed cancer in her nose and one of her nostrils. And after about three months, it was nothing to do for her, and ended up had a vet come out and put her to sleep. We buried her in the backyard. I'm from Cromwell, Kentucky. Kentucky, you came yep. down to see the Gunthers today? Yep. Yeah. Well, he's, a, he's a fellow sorghum maker. Makes, oh. Makes sorghum. I, I met Mark, what, probably 10 years ago. Probably something like that, like that yeah. And, uh, we, uh, we enjoy coming to these, especially like this. I like the old timey way, so. Yeah. yeah did you it, tell me you made 450 gallons yeah, this year? Yeah, we made 450, which ain't ain't a drop in the bucket compared to his, right, but, it's, but it's, it's a good hobby, so. Yeah, it's, it's a, but, uh, it'll still help a lot of biscuits. Any, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yep. It'll, yeah. A whole lot of sweetening, so. Yeah. Look like my wife's about to get away from me up through there now. But anyway, I'm, I'm glad you do all this too, because it's, I like the word getting out to all this old old type stuff, so. Well, glad you made it down today. Well, thanks, thanks, thanks for coming and seeing us. All right, well, we'll see you, Have a safe see you in back. February. Y'all okay. be careful. Yep. So, uh, tell us where you're from. Gary Smith from Lexington, North Carolina. Lexington? Yeah. Are you, are you uh, 
come down to the Tennessee to stay for a few days? Or Actually, watching your channel, found out Mark's going to be down here uh, a few weeks ago and uh, watching your channel, and I told my wife, I said, we're going down there to see you. Well, so uh, we took off down here. We were over in Muddy Pond uh, August, something like that. We run around, kind of followed a lot of your... <laughs> <laughs> Your stuff. I, I like seeing stuff like that. So yeah. that's how we wound up here. What do you think about Cage Cove? Have you been I here before? It. Oh, I have. Yeah. yeah. Many times. But Beautiful, beautiful place. It's beautiful. It? And it's a beautiful day today. Yeah. Why not? For November uh, the 16th, it's uh, 70 degrees today. Yeah. Uh, it's something yeah. else. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Trees are bare, but yeah. or for the most part. But still, still a nice place. Yeah. 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 I like this stuff. I go back. I was telling Mark, my granddad, uh, uh, lived up in Valley Cruces, mass oh, store area. Yeah. I was a mass store when, back in the 50s when I was a kid growing up. Oh. Uh, so uh, I'm very familiar with that. My mother and dad are both up in that area. So this kind of stuff is, it's refreshing. You know, I've seen it before. Actually, fiddled with it a little bit, but uh, I'm no expert on it by no means. But I have <laughs> skimmed a little bit. <laughs> I have the... Uh, of course, we call it making molasses, but uh, uh, I have a cousin that still has the skimmers that my granddad used. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. all these years, they still work, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so, thanks for coming and visiting us. I, I enjoy it. I'm telling you what. Right. feels like I've known you forever. Well, I sat you're sitting watching you <laughs> on the videos. Isn't that something? Yeah. yeah. But uh, Gary and Donna Smith, we're from Lexington, North Carolina. We're about 25 miles or so south of Winston-Salem. And been watching John's videos for months now. I don't know, maybe even over a year that I ran across you on YouTube. And uh, now we wouldn't miss one. Just uh, watch it all the time. Have enjoyed and been able to go to a lot of the places that uh, you uh, posted in RM Brooks, you know, various stores and uh, been around. Been over in Mighty Pond this summer and got to see the Gunther's place. And been so interesting. Did well, you make it to R.M. Brooks' way? Well, I did. It? Been yeah. there. Yes, had the bologna sandwich twice. the whole nine yards. <laughs> We've been there twice this summer. Well, how about so, that? Sure yeah. Yeah. You kind of feel like you know them when you get there from watching it the is. videos, don't it you? It is. Uh, we sat and watched this, and that's what I told Mark when we walked up. I feel like I've known him for, uh, you know, a, a long time now, just uh, simply by looking. And just from my family background you know I grew up uh, I didn't grow up living like this but because of my grandparents and so on uh, up in the uh, Valley Cruces area of North Carolina and uh, my both of my parents from up in there so I have a connection with all this I've been around it so and, brings back good memories oh it, it does <laughs> it, it really does I tickles me to dance so now, how about you? Are you as excited about going to these places and see if you like it too? It. Huh? I love it. Yeah. She, she, she hangs around with me. Uh, she, um, she wasn't uh, around the mountains like I was. Uh, she had some grandparents for them that lived up in the Trap Hill area of Wilkes County and that sort of thing like that. But uh, uh, to be back up in the Boone Banner Elk when, when we met and married and I took her up there, it's a new experience for her so uh, but we we love visiting uh, these places uh, all these stores it just reminds me of uh, years gone by you know sometimes i feel like rip van the winkle i feel like i laid down one night and went to sleep and woke up 30 years later and wondering what happened all the time but it goes by fast <laughs> it goes by fast <laughs> have enjoyed it and look forward to seeing more Thank you for the channel. Sure, that uh, gives us some place to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've kind of become a travel and destination channel. It wasn't really what I was working on eventually, but uh, originally, but people just started showing up these places when I started filming them, and then uh, yeah. wasn't really, yeah. wasn't for sure uh, how it was going to do. But it seems like people enjoy uh, finding these places and visiting them. I I, I like to go see well, this like, a lot of you know you wouldn't if if somebody wasn't there. Uh, letting us know about it, uh, then you just don't know. If word of mouth will travel pretty slow. Yeah. And of course now you pick up a phone or you flip on your TV and all of it's at your fingertips, you know. So uh, 
Absolutely. My next, my next project I want to do um, oh my mind. Who's the guy that does the painting over there? Ricky. Ricky. Ricky, Ricky Rock. Rock. Yeah. Uh, that's my next ambition is to get contact him. Uh, after I retired, I bought a little sawmill, and I want to get him to paint me a truck door and it's got my sawmill stuff on it and hanging on the wall down there so that's my next uh thing i want to do but i i have enjoyed it enjoyed this love your uh channel and we just we don't miss it <laughs> we don't miss it uh, see them all come on down put your hand right there in her bridle and stand right close to her like you like her like you like you yeah. like, like, it, like it's family you know yeah okay one two three go <laughs> Make sure I got the vision. Right. Yeah. What we Anyway, <laughs> who are we looking at? Right over there. Which camera are we looking at? Okay. All right. You want one too? No, thanks. No? Okay. Y'all? All right. Go into those details. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you stand right here? Or you got somebody taking your picture? Yes. Put, put your hand in the bridle and you sort of stand behind her because you're a little bit taller and put your hand up here on her neck and now look at the camera. There you go. So I have the barbecue sauce, which is my recipe made with sorghum. Okay, here's the barbecue sauce. The sorghum is really good. Uh -huh. I've always kind of wondered if you shouldn't have just what I call regular in the last Uh-huh. Mm, that's very good. That's my recipe. Sorghum is the main ingredient in it. I am a barbecue snob. I'm telling you, it's really good. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you. Did you want to taste the sorghum? Okay, here's the sorghum. That's the sorghum. And here's the barbecue sauce. I just wanted to say that um, me and my husband, we do these sorghum making demonstrations. We're trying to keep the heritage of, of sorghum syrup making alive. Um, a lot of people don't know what it is. And a few years ago, I started making the barbecue sauce, made it at home. It's been about eight years that we made it where we can sell it now. Um, and a lot of people, if they don't like the sorghum, they'll like the barbecue sauce. And that's the reason we're making it. But uh -huh. but the reason that, I mean, I was, I was here at this table, right here at Kate's Cove, a couple weeks ago. And there was an older lady. She was probably in her 80s. And she wanted a taste of the sorghum, and I gave her a taste, and she put it in her mouth. She closed her eyes, and she, she named off, she reminded her of some place. It brings tears to my eyes because it was the, I, I mean, you know, to bring memories back to her. That was just meant a lot. And then the same day, there was a little girl, probably three, four years old, and she come up, and she said, could I have a taste of that sorghum? She said sorghum, and I, I, got, I thought it was so, so sweet of her. And um, the little girl took a taste of it and she said, mm, that's good, I like that. And so we just like to, that's the reason we do this. We want the younger people to see what it is, trying to keep it alive, trying to keep, get them to like it. And the older people, it brings back memories to them. And it's just so sweet. You'll, there'll be a family bring their uh, mom down here or their dad in a wheelchair and they'll come up to the table and they remember their grandpa doing this or, or their dad maybe. And um, it's, just, it's just great to be able to keep that alive for people. So what's your name? My name's Keith. Keith? Yeah. And you help uh, here at the park? You're one of the park employees? Well, yeah, we're a nonprofit that helps the park. Out. Okay, a nonprofit that helps yeah. the park, okay. Yeah, all the proceeds go to, into the park for education, historical buildings like you, you see around here. Okay. And, yeah, education. So the money made from uh, selling the, the products here at the Cage Cove goes to preserving the buildings and stuff. Yep. Oh, how about that? That's good to know. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, people's uh, helping preserve history when they're buying stuff here, ain't they? That's it, whether they know it or not. <laughs> well, that's great. So what's this right here? Who makes this right here? Food, Foods of the Smokies. Yeah, this in particular um, is 
from the old mill in Pigeon Forge. Okay, yeah. Yeah, they grind that there, don't they? Yep. Yeah, they've been doing that for since the 1800s, I think, haven't they? Yeah, I think 1830-something. Yeah, yeah. Yep. still operating mill. Yep, and this uh, mill down here behind me is uh, called the Cable Grist Mill. It, op it started in 1870. We used to sell it out of there, but uh, since we're in the National Park, we can't get, keep the critters out, and so... That they used to grind it there? Yeah, we oh, did, really? we're actually grinding today for, as a demonstration. Oh, I didn't know that, so it's running down there today. Yes, sir, even with the, our big drought, it's still still enough water to keep it going. So. Oh, sounds good. I'll have to go down and film that. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Yep. Function, and we might grind maybe about 15 pounds a day. And what are they making up on the oak, oak there? So he is making uh, sorghum molasses or, or, or sorghum syrup. Uh, it, it's uh, very similar to sugarcane molasses, uh, but up, up here they would grow uh, sorghum cane because sugarcane doesn't grow this far north. And so it, it grows a lot like green from the, the, the plant, it begins to rise to the top, and it, it makes like this green foam on the top. And he, he's uh, just skimming it off out there, and he'll just keep skimming it until all the green. Make smaller pieces, makes the fire burn a lot better. Somebody said, you ever hit your foot? Nope, I hadn't hit my foot. You can see there, I don't have any ax marks on there. <laughs> but I've got a little secret to it. Everybody's wondering, how do I not hit my foot? Well, you notice there, I'm hitting down like that. And part of the secret is, is to keep the handle low right there. And a little hard on the ax, and you see there, it's sort of blunt on the front end. But you see there, I'm letting that ax go into the dirt. And that's what's keep, keeping it from hitting me. So it's actually not as dangerous as you think. When my mom was a young girl, she was quite a tomboy and did a lot of work outside. I remember I was just real young when she taught me this. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> that ricocheted there, huh? Yep, we come here to the park and do these sorghum making demonstrations. Used to be an important part of the of uh, heritage here. Most families that lived here would have grown some cane and this would have been their staple as a sweetener with this and honey. And uh, so we come, Park has us come here and do these demonstrations to stir a few memories for the older people that used to, that remember doing it as a childhood and the younger ones that have never done it never seen it like those little ones there they've probably never seen it before and so it's a good thing for the older and the young and that down there i keep pointing to that but that was an original meal down there and that was the original furnace my meal here my friend uh, john is doing the grinding there right now and it's my mule ida going around in circles and so that is sorghum cane pressing uh, as he feeds them in there that presses the juice out but anyway back to the mill it has a date on the bottom of it there of 1896, so it's over 100 years old. And that one over there was somewhere around 50 years older than that. And of course, that's laid up with red clay and, and, uh, red, uh, and, and stone. And you only press it once, not twice? Yes, well, it actually is pressing twi uh, twice there. The old mill down there has two large steel rollers in it, and you see it has a wood frame on it to hold it and it only passed between it once. My mill here was actually a modern mill. It has one large roller and two small rollers and it passes through there twice. And so uh, it does a better job getting all the juice out. You can see how the, 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 the pressed out cane stalks is called pumice. And you can see how they're falling apart as they 
fall down there and if you put a piece of that in your mouth you're spitting it out immediately because it's just chaff and dry. Yeah, It's a way for us to keep some old ways alive which if I could live on nothing I would do it for nothing. But I have to have a little butter on my bread and so I have to make some money with it so that I can drive here and there and, uh, and, and, and so you know I have to have a little money so in turn we sell sorghum to the park they sell our sorghum and they sell a lot of it when we're here and it's good for them and good for us and I get to do what I like and so the reason that I use the mules uh, I actually grew up old order Mennonite I grew up farming with me uh, with horses did not have mules when I grew up but we had horse Belgian horses and uh, I got pretty fond of that and today I love living in both worlds. I love to work with my mules and my Belgian horses but I also like to get in my truck and a nice trailer and home sweet home in that trailer and we travel around to a lot of places and do these sorghum making demonstrations. We also go to Tampa, Florida to the state fair and do a sugarcane making demonstration. That's like 700 miles down there but it's in the middle of the winter in February and we enjoy going doing that. But you might say we're quite passionate about syrup, syrup connoisseurs. Yeah, <laughs> we love it, and especially sorghum syrup, but have gotten a little bit involved with that uh, sugar cane making, but, and that's also good, but you know, the sorghum is really good for you. It, it's really good, and it's good for you. A very healthy sweetener, a very, it's high in uh, potassium antioxidants. It's a very healthy sweetener. Promise you it won't make you fat, but the butter and the biscuits will get you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anybody else want to taste the sorghum or barbecue sauce? And how much are the Those are fifteen thirty-five, and the large is nineteen. Would you like a taste of it? Sure. Okay. This is the sorghum. Anybody want to try the barbecue sauce? It's my recipe made with the sorghum. <laughs> I know some of you are happy. She likes it. That was the best. <laughs> she liked the barbecue sauce. <laughs> Yeah, I met Mark and Sherry at, at really at Dollywood when I was a conductor on the train there, and he was set up was set up right across from our train station, and I started working with him on my days off, and then then I just started working with him quite a bit, and and as my part time job with Dollywood ended, I just started working with him, and then every year I'd just sneak up there and help him a little bit more and more. And, and I've been coming out here to the cove when he comes out here in September and November and helping him on the weekends then. And it's about any time I feed near or around, I'll try to go out there and give him a hand. I just enjoy doing this. It's just, I just a lot of hard work, but I love doing it. It's a lot of fun. To me, it is. Because you're working with the animals and you're really learning a lot. It's, there's a lot to it. You have to put cane in the mill, right? You get juice everywhere and everything, putting the mill in there, putting the cane into the mill and getting all that right. And, and cooking it, that's the good part over there. That's that's where you really learn over there is the cooking part. And that's what he's really good at. And I'm, I'm getting close to it, but it's still right there at the finishing part. That gets tricky. You've got to know what you're doing and get it off quick. Or you'll end up with a whole bunch of scorched syrup <laughs> and a lot of hours of work. <laughs> So they've actually they've actually let you be uh, help cook. Down oh yeah, oh line. absolutely, yeah. yeah. Usually right up until the time it needs to come right off because you you don't stir it much. You just keep skimming it, and then at some point you have to stir to keep it from sticking, and then you have to fan it. And I can do some of that, but at some point when it comes really close to taking it off, he knows exactly when to take it off. You and it know that just from experience. From oh yes, absolutely, back. yes. Now where are you originally from? Texas. Texas, and you can move to Tennessee when? Uh, October seventeen. 2017. 2017, and we've been staying here about eight months out of the year now. And okay. We go back home to Texas and catch up with family and grandkids, and now they come up here to visit us, so we, we're spending more and more time up here. So you look forward to getting to come help them uh, do this? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, I love to come up here and help them with this. It's just a lot of fun. Had you seen uh, sorghum being made like that before you saw them over at Dollywood? Never. I've never I, I come from cane country, and I never saw it made like that. And this is when the first time I saw him out here, I, I never, I didn't know what he was doing. Didn't have a clue. And uh, just kind of stood around and watched him. And then when he got to Dollywood, I got to really watch him what he was doing. And then when I got to helping him, I got to really seeing it. But no, up until then, I'd never even seen it. Didn't even know what it was. And now I, now I use sorghum on everything. <laughs> well, you eat sorghum on. Uh, any kind of bread products. My wife makes a cookie with it. Uh, she makes breads with it. I do a lot of barbecue. 
I do a lot of pork barbecue and stuff like that. And so in my cooking process, during the cooking process before I wrap it, I completely cover it in sorghum and more spices than wrap it for the finishing cook. And my barbecue sauces, is, it's about half sorghum. And it's uh, other spices, but it's, I used to about use it for everything I use honey or sugar for, I use sorghum for now, even in my coffee. But this one here is, once she hands out, that's the ones people look forward to. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. That, that cookie's just a different, it's just a different taste cookie. Can you taste the sorghum, man? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You can taste the sweetness in it. I don't know if you can identify it as sorghum, but it's something different. It's not like a regular sugar cookie. And uh, it's, it's, it's got a real good taste to it. And we, we, uh, we hand them out as gifts and everything else, and people love those things. And my wife's known for baking, especially pies and cakes and stuff like that, but her biggest request lately is the cookies, the sorghum cookies. <laughs> I'm still skimming just a little bit. It's still a little bit of green around some places. But it's getting not too far from being done. And you can see it's starting to foam up pretty good here. And once it starts foaming up, then it will, in order to control it from boiling over, I do what some of the old timers call it, fanning it. See, by doing that right there, puts a little air through it and cools it down a little bit so that my pan doesn't fall over. And then I can also stir it. So I have two scoops here. One of, them, one of them is the skimmer. It has the little holes in it. And then the other one does not have holes in it. So at the end here, I have to use both tools to get it cooked down to the correct consistency. What do you do if it starts raining on you, Mark? If it what? It starts raining. Well, it just takes longer to cook it out. It, uh, the question is, what, what I do if it starts raining? Well, it rains into here, and so I'm boiling water out of it. It just takes a little more wood to just keep boiling it and, and uh, boil the extra water out of it. But it, it, it can be a little bit difficult. As long as it doesn't rain too terribly hard, I keep right on and going. If it, if it gets to raining too hard, then I... Uh, I have to get the batch off and just quit for the day. Now you were saying it was 21 degrees here a few weeks ago? Yes, two weeks ago when we came up here, it was the first weekend in November, it was 21 degrees and it was it was really cold. This pan had, was there was about two inches of water on it. And of course it was froze solid ice. We had to, get a, had to get a fire going in there and melted the ice out. But uh, there, a piece of suck. Soot, is it soot or soot? But anyway, you can see here how it's a boiling up. Fan it just a little bit. That, that little bit of fanning helps keep it under control to keep it from boiling over. See how it's just sort of set down a little bit there. If I let it keep on going like that, it would, it would boil over the sides. And then also because it's cooled down, it allows me just a little bit of chance there to get a little bit more green out of it. And that's of utmost importance is to get that green out of it. That's actually what makes it the nice golden brown color. Not that that's so terribly important. If it were dark, you couldn't see it, wouldn't matter. But usually when sorghum is a nice golden brown color, it's, uh, it's much... Uh, much milder flavor. It doesn't have a have such a strong bite to it. Now, do you do you adjust the tilt on this during the day, or just uh, not much? Not much during the day. Uh, sideways, occasionally I have to because it's just sitting on the ground. Occasionally I have to tilt it up and put a little rock under it to sort of level it up sideways. The long ways. Right now I have it the front up a little bit higher, so the juice is a little deeper in the back because the heat is here in the back and it's not quite as deep in the front but uh during the cooking is not much don't do much tilting but when the batch gets done we'll then tilt the whole thing forward take the plug out and run the whole batch out so y'all can see how it's really starting to foam up there and i'm going to have to really do some sanding here from being done and uh, so that, that's what i go by and then also um 
You see how I'm holding that up there and how that it's sheeting and, and uh, right there, see how it's sheeting and stringing off of there? That right there is good, but I needed to do it just as quick as I raise it up there. Because, you know, being, uh, you, you know, y'all thinking this stuff is, you know, thin as water. And it looks like it's thin as water. And, but the reason is, is because we're at least 220 degrees hot. And everybody knows water boils at 212 degrees hot. And so this being, you know, several degrees over the boiling of water. And it's the reason, because it's the syrup in it, the sugars in this juice. The natural sugars is what makes it thick. So the way this furnace works, the fire is at this end. If I had this large cavity, let me come around there and show you. This cavity in through here, open all the way down, the heat would go through this thing and out the chimney. It never, I, I wouldn't be able to get the heat up. So I came up with this idea and built this little oven in on this end right here. And it's a, and the heat goes in over the top of that and over the top of that oven and then out the chimney and forces the heat up. And uh, that little oven is wonderful to bake potatoes, to heat up some meat, make some biscuits, roast some peanuts. We've done it all in it. We have, we've had a lot of fun with it. So yeah, it's really a, a little fun, fun tool for making ourselves some snacks and stuff. And yes, I, bu I built this stove, so that would have been an original furnace there. You know, that's what I grew up with, was, was uh, well, I don't think we had rock, but we would have had brick and uh, red clay, mortar probably, uh, furnace. But that was an original furnace. But uh, that is basically, you know, a lot of work to move that. I mean, it could be disassembled rock at a time and move it to a new place. But I came up with this idea to build this little stove, and uh, so y'all can see, uh, it's like quarter inch plate steel, and then it's lined with fire brick on the side. Now the first one that I built 30 years ago, I got it built and we went off to a, uh, to a festival and set that thing up, and it didn't have any brick in it, and let me tell you, when it came to this part, this thing was so hot. I stood there like this, my bib overalls were literally smoking because there was so much heat came through there. So I came up with this idea to, to dry stack um, br fire brick in there and then it has those steel bands on the edge, on the, on the splices and I put those bolts through there. And so the way I move this furnace, um, a bolt comes out here, the chimney lays down. A bolt comes out here and you put a tongue onto this and you hook it up to the bumper of your car or pickup or the back of a trailer or whatever. And then it has these little rods right here and that pipe slips over that right there. This, uh, this leg right there, a pipe slips over that, one on each side. I'm gonna have to keep stirring here because y'all seen those bubbles come up. Anyway, you get those legs on each side there and you pull up and that raises that up. And then you see that slot right down there in the bottom? I have an axle for that with a wheel on each side and the axle goes around the wheel on the other side and bolt it on there and down the road we go. Because uh, that steel with the fire brick, it's very heavy. Yeah, if, you, if we go to a place that has uh, like a forklift, a front end loader, easy to load and unload, but you know, we don't have anything like that here. So um, yeah, I came up with that idea. We, we, actually, we actually started this a little before lunch, and uh, uh, so we've been simmering along all day, and we've got about, uh, I think, 25 or 28 gallons of juice in there. I don't have to ask my friend here, John, I don't know, he's disappeared, but uh, he, he's been helping me, but something like that. But we've been cooking on it for four and a half or five hours, and we should get about mm, 10 to 12 quarts out of this batch of syrup. So... Uh, people in the midsection of this country back in the 1800s, early 1900s, just really didn't have a whole lot of sweetener here other than honey. So back in those days, we did not have pavement and semi-trucks like we have today. So how do you all think sugar got to this part of the country? Mules in a wagon, boat, train. Once it did get in the stores, uh, it was too expensive. These, these were poor people here in the mountains. They, they wouldn't have been able to have bought sugar. And uh, even if the store had it, they wouldn't have been able to buy sugar. So you see those large bubbles coming on here. It's getting pretty close. And you see, it sort of looks like a hog eye, doesn't it? 
But anyway, sorghum cane was brought here from South Asia and Africa uh, with, the, with the intent, several universities were involved in it. Uh, there, there's a, you can actually dig up the history on all these. And were, uh, they were determined to make sugar out of this. They did successfully make some sugar, sugar out of it, but it was not economical. They could not make masses amount of sugar out of it to, to uh, actually be, uh, to be able to make much sweetener out of it. So, but the, the sorghum stayed around and uh, history says that there was many hundreds of thousands of gallons made from the mid 1800s till depression, World War II. And there was one other aspect about it, not just because of pavement and semi trucks. The, the aspect of it was some of y'all are old enough to remember this, that slave trade that was going on down in the south. There was, there was a lot of, uh, most of the sugar was being made with slave trade. And so from here to up north, uh, most, most people would not even buy sugar, even if it was available, because they knew they were supporting the slave trade in the south if they brought sugar. So, bought sugar. so because of that, sorghum became extremely popular. Everybody grew a patch of cane, and not everybody had this equipment, but somebody in the community would have had this equipment, and, uh, and they would have, uh, if, say if I would have been a farmer, and would have had some cane, I would have taken it to this neighbor that had this equipment, and, uh, yeah, I'm ready, go ahead. And for, to give a share of the cane, Sorry about the squeaking, I have greased it, but because of the heat, it just keeps burning the grease and all out of it. But they would have given about a third of their syrup to the man that owned the equipment. Again, money was scarce. People, people couldn't afford anything with money. They had to work for it or give a portion of it. And so it was a very, very popular sweetener in this country. So y'all are wondering what am I doing it, pouring it in this barrel for? And the reason is, um, we are here in Tennessee. Uh, the health department in Tennessee is very strict about you can't make anything outdoors like this and sell it to the public without an inspection. And you cannot get an inspection in Tennessee unless you're indoors, you have to have closed walls, windows, or at least screened in. So, the park 100% supports that. And so I put it in that barrel. I am supposed to throw it away, but that barrel goes in my trailer, and I just want to tell you this, I'm not wasteful. So, that's the reason I'm putting it in a jar. And, and what we're selling over here on the table, we make that at our, on our farm at Muddy Pond Sorghum. And uh, we are totally enclosed, health department, uh, in health department graces, sometimes it's, it's difficult, but we make lots of sorghum. And if any of y'all would like to see that operation, that muddy pond there where we make lots of sorghum, you can go on a YouTube channel called the Appalachian Channel. And uh, some really, really nice documentation of where we do everything from hog killing to making sorghum to our way of life. The Appalachian Channel, or it's just Appalachian Channel. So what I am gonna do, I'm gonna go around the circle here. Y'all will just, everybody just stay right where you're at, and we're gonna lick the, the ladle. Just put your, yep. no, you can't literally put your tongue on it, but I'm gonna just let you finger it. And in the meantime, I'm gonna multi-dip, multi-time dip, Pure syrup, just just took it off. I'm gonna flip it over. Oh, thank you. What do y'all think about that? That's good stuff, isn't it? Yeah. So, y'all might want to take you a jar of that home with you. It's really good stuff. You might want to go over and my wife Sherry there is sitting behind the table. She'll give you a sample of the barbecue sauce. That's her recipe that we make using the sorghum as the main ingredient. 
Promise you both are very healthy for you. The sorghum is very high in antioxidant, pa yes. potassium. Promise you it won't make you fat. Sorry, the, the butter and the biscuits will get you though. Okay. Yeah. Look, she got left out. She wants a taste. Oh, sorry. No, I'm good. I've tasted it. Is it hot? No, not anymore. All right. Oh, yeah. Mm. Isn't that good? And thick. You know, a while ago when I was cooking that, it looked thin as water, right? It's because it's like 230, 228 to 230. Like I said, I don't use a thermometer, I just, you know, guess it, but I've had enough experience to know that that's around that. Yeah. Good stuff. How long did you cook this uh, This batch took about four and a half hours. Okay. Did it come from the stock? Yes. So the cane is on top of the trailer there. It's, it's, it's long, thin stalks. Uh, if you saw a field of it, you'd think it's a field of corn. Mm -hmm. The only thing is... Um, uh, you know, you'd say, well, I don't see any corn ears on there. It has a little different seat. I've seen the sorghum field yes. before, and I always wondered what, you don't use the grain. You actually we, we actually use the juice out of the stalk, yes. Okay. Is yes. the grain used for anything else? Well, now, there are some, it does make really good animal feed from all the different, but there are different, several different breeds of sorghum. Ours is a long, thin stalk, about 12-foot stalks, and... Uh, the, like the grain you're talking about is a grain sorghum. Uh, a lot of that is being grown now because it does really well in drier climates. And uh, that seed then can be... A lot of people nowadays have begun, have gotten to be... Uh, um, I can't think of the word, but, it, but they, they can't tolerate flour made from... Gluten, gluten free, yes. And so this grain sorghum is gluten free. And then, of course, you know, masses amounts of it is used for animal feed. It's a very nutritious feed, yes. Uh -huh. This is not blackstrap. This is this is pure sorghum cane, and the end product is sorghum syrup. Now, blackstrap comes from sugar cane, which is boiled down just like this, but like that strainer we poured that through would fill up with sugar, and the syrup that runs through it is actually the blackstrap. And sugar beets, which is grown in North and South Dakota and Nebraska, uh, would be the same thing. It has a byproduct called blackstrap. Blackstrap, straight blackstrap, is basically not edible. It's very, very strong. What you see in the grocery stores, grandma's molasses and everything else, if you read the label, there's about 20% of it is blackstrap molasses, the other 80% is high fructose corn syrup. Has no sorghum in it, but tastes very similar to sorghum. When you when you're raised on the farm, you, you learn how to do stuff, you know, from from hardships and doing without, you know. When you go tell dad that's broke, oh no, well, you yeah. it fixed. Yeah. You never went and said something was broke. Yeah. You just fixed it and went. Very lots, cool. of, lots of hard work on the farm. But I will say this, you know, in life, uh, you can work hard, hard all your life. But if you don't have a plan up here oh, yeah. or a plan on paper, you know, I'm going to do so and so and so today and the next day or the next week, you can work yourself into the ground and never get anywhere. Well, that's why I got married. My wife got she, she, She's got the plan. Yeah, yeah. I just, so along for the ride. Right. So it's it's very important, you know, to stay focused, have a plan and stay on it. And and it's so easy in life to um, uh, be all fired up and enthused about something like this. You know. Hey. So how the how have you been doing with this uh Wow dog? girl? <laughs> Look, there's your daddy. She don't care about me. She likes you better. You've been, you let her play kept, all day. She kept going crazy a while ago, and I took her over there, and we went around, and she got in the creek. Did she? She's drinking, drinking, drinking. She must have been thirsty she then. She has been... Handful. Grabbing everybody. <laughs> oh, she's fine. She wants she's the, just a puppy. She wants everybody's attention, don't she? She's, she's a puppy. Fine. Thank you for letting us help. Well, tell, tell everybody what your names is again. Tell oh, us. I'm David Shope, and this is Cora. I'm Cora Shope. And you're all from where, We're tell from us? Cleveland, Tennessee. Cleveland, Tennessee. Cleveland, Tennessee. Well, that's not that far from here. Yeah. We started watching John on YouTube about probably two or three months ago. We ditched cable. I don't know if I should say that or not. But <laughs> And we love YouTube, so we love John, and I didn't know that we were going to be able to meet him, so we wound up being up here all day with him, and we loved him. 
We were sitting there talking. The I said, I'm going to go get the dog. You said you'd watch her. And I said, I'll go get her. So you've had your hands full with her. Hey, she's fine. Thank she's you so much for, uh, oh, you're welcome. for watching her. It's let her get out of the motor home today. She's enjoyed that. I'll send you a bill. Send me a bill. <laughs> I'll give it to her. She'll send you a check back. Okay. <laughs> She'll trade you some good chewed up sticks. Yeah. Slacking. Not that I'm gonna go fast enough that this cane would blow off, but there's some low limbs in and out of here that wanna hang and pull it off. I don't know if you'd noticed or not, but right here in the front where the mules stand, that's where we have the where we keep the wood. It's sort of an empty spot right under their heads. It works pretty good. Even it out just a little bit where we got that wood out today. Hang these bridles on their hames and let them carry their own bridles. Don't have to put their bridles on them. Back out. Back out, Ida. Maddie, wait on her. You back out. Go back on out. Back on out. Back on out. Go. go ahead and close this gate. Go. Come girls. Come. You want her to go? Come on. What'd you get, Mark? I got a half a chicken, and I don't know. These are some uh, potatoes here that uh, really, these little black ones, oh, they are delicious. <laughs> of course, that's arse taters, or red taters. Yeah. But these little black ones, oh, they are just really, really good. I've, I've never seen black <laughs> taters before. He likes these. <laughs> What's I this? got truffle fries. Truffle fries. Yeah, them are good, and then some kind of salad. Wow, <laughs> what a salad. I'm going to try them. They good. David, did you get chicken? We got half the chicken and some of the black taters that Mark said. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Brussels sprout. Very good. It's uh, about almost 7 o'clock at night now, Eastern time here. We just got back from the cove and had, had a wonderful supper with Mr. John and some other friends that we met today, and we're about to go in the barn here at Miss Frida's place. She used to own, and well, she owns, still owns, and runs Pack Stable here. And uh, just getting on up in age, and she no longer was able to take care of the public here, and she decided to close the business. But us being good friends, she allows us to come here, and there's some other people that come. She allows to come here and. We try to help her out with a uh, taking taking care of some of the bills that she get that she has throughout the year for this. But I want to be clear about it. This is friends only. She's not open for business. So whatever you see on the barn, or it's a very nice place that she has here, but there she's not open to the public. It's just because we're friends that she lets us come here. But a very nice place. It's got all these really nice stalls here has a bathroom in the barn of course we got a bathroom in the in the trailer and then uh, we back our easy Ida, easy Ida's in a hurry she wants to go 
go in. She knows it's. She, she's been. I and Maddie been here so much. It's almost like their second home. They they know where they're going. Yeah, and I've got the door open there, and I is ready to go in. Going in. Going in. I've been up front and been in here and filled their buckets with water. I'm going to go ahead and take Maddie's harness off. Been wearing it. It's been a long day for him carrying this harness. They like it here in these stalls. Got a little hay rack. I'm gonna go upstairs and drop them some hay down. And we got a little feed box in the corner. I'll give them some grain. Doesn't really have hooks here in the barn to hang up harness, but uh, I just use this door here, hang the harness on it like that. Put the other one right away. Come, I'll take your collar off. You're tired, aren't you? There you go. They like to flop their head and shake their ears. Good feeling for them to be out of that harness, I guess. Do they sleep standing up? No, they lay down. Yeah, if we come out here later on at night, there they lay down in there. Yeah. Pretty you know, Manny and I are pretty big mules. The stalls are they're just a little bit small for uh, that large of mules, but they make out pretty good in there. No, it, they would be too small for the Belgian horses. Oh, they like that. So, now back up and I'll put it right here in your manger. Okay, I've got them their water. I've got them their grain. Now I need to go upstairs and give them their hay. It's a little bit dark there, but you're welcome to follow me if you want. I don't know how well you can see with your camera, but Ida is in this pen right here, and this is hay that I've already got up here. I'm just gonna throw those chunks down there and they'll eat it right out of those, between those slats. Right there you can see Maddie right over there. Right down there and then I'll drop this hay. Of course that grain, that's, that's their number one choice. They're gonna eat every speck of that until they can, uh, until that's all gone before they eat any hay. But yeah, pretty nice, pretty nice setup she's got here, you know. To put the hay upstairs and then put the put it down in the mangers from upstairs. You don't actually have to get in the pen with them to, to feed them their hay. Like I said, she's got a very nice barn here. Yeah. Well, we want to say thank you all for watching uh, our family story on uh, on in this series of uh, of sorghum making with the way we do it at home at Muddy Pond and the way we do it when we. Uh, Go away from home the old-fashioned way with mules and it's really not to make massive amounts of sorghum it's just to portray and show uh, how how that sorghum making used to be done in especially here in the in Cage Cove in the Great Smoky Mountains a beautiful place and uh, we love coming here and we have so many people that come here and and watch us making sorghum and also like for y'all to Follow us to other places where we go do this sorghum making, these uh, sorghum making demonstrations. And we actually go to uh, Tampa, Florida to the state fair. And we'd love for all, all northern and southern people as, as well. But in February, when we go to the Tampa State Fair, it's nice and warm. Uh, yeah, really nice summertime in mid-February. And you're not making sorghum there. And we're not making <laughs> sorghum at home at that time. And, but those dates... Uh, but what when are we you go, making there at the fair, though? Yeah, those dates when we go to the Tampa Fair are uh, February the 8th through the 19th. But there we don't do sorghum making demonstration. We actually do ribbon cane syrup. It's just a little sugar bit cane. different kind of a cane. It is actually a type of sugar cane. The stalks do look very similar, but uh, we press the juice out with the same number 12 Chattanooga mill and press and uh, but the boiling is a little bit different it's uh, we actually do it on a cast iron kettle instead of on a flat bottom pan so we'd love to invite everybody from up north to south to come to the Florida State Fair and come to Cracker Country a beautiful village that the state has put together there uh, preserving the history of schools churches country stores and all kinds of old time artisan crafts. It's a great place to visit in February. So come visit us and thank you all for following us. What's and, the date? And, and, and uh, here uh, in the Smoky Mountains. And again, the dates for the Florida Fair are 
uh, February the 8th through the 19th. It's 12 days. And then also, um, we do a lot of other demonstrations at other places also here in Tennessee. Uh, that we start out at the Wilson County Fair, which is also combined with the Tennessee State Fair now in, in August, the middle of August, and that's in Lebanon, Tennessee. We go to the Fall Creek Falls to the Mountaineer Festival. That's the uh, first weekend after Labor Day every year. Um, we do this here at Cades Cove about eight weekends. We usually come in September and then back in November. We don't come in October, and the reason for that is there's a lot of visitors because of the changing leaves and everything here in October and it would just be so much more traffic and so much more you know on the road if we were here too you know because that would cause a lot of people you know to come see us also so we come in September and November uh, then where else do we go? Well we go to the um, Mountain Brothers General Store yeah, we in going, Wares Valley. We have just started that one and we plan on going every weekend as far as long as the weather holds up in December of this year uh, on Friday, Saturday and Sunday as far as we know to the Mountain Brothers General Store in Wares Valley. Um, it's a very busy place there. They have a lot of people come through and, and we you know we plan to do that every weekend this year. We, we normally had been going to Dollywood and this is the first year we didn't get to go to Dollywood. They, they just you know sort of discontinued the sorghum making there at Dollywood. And so we're trying to make up for it, you know going to this Mountain Brothers General Store and all these other places. Um, but also at the, at the Tennessee I mean at the Florida State Fair when he's making the sugarcane syrup, we do sell our sorghum there and our barbecue sauce. We don't sell sugarcane syrup, we sell our sorghum syrup. Yeah. And also, um, the other thing I was want to say is that you can, you can go to our website and, and uh, under festivals, I'll have it listed. I, I haven't got it yet for this next year, but I will have, for very soon I'll have all the dates of all the festivals and that's uh, www.muddypondsorghum.com and you can find all the dates of all these festivals that we go to. And, and, and if for any reason that we can't go a certain date that she has posted, uh, just say, just so much rain or so much snow that we can't go she immediately posts it so always I'll, check that website the if website you, and the facebook page the, the facebook page is easier you know to get it on and that's muddy pond sorghum mill facebook page but but she always posts it especially if you're traveling a long way check those two social media uh stations there to to see make sure that we're going to be there if for some reason we can't be there we she posts it just as soon as as we know that we're not going to be able to make it. But thanks again for watching and following us, and goodbye, everybody. And it's been See you next time at one of the festivals, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> been wonderful doing this. Thank you. <laughs>